a chat with Glendora, a show for living right. A chat with Glendora makes your day so bright. Words of inspiration, jokes to make you smile. Come relax and chat with Glendora for a while. Folks, I have something here that's going to warm you up and just make you feel so good. I have Mr. James Bias, who is the executive director of the Connecticut Humane Society. Jim, will you tell me that story about Rufus Dog? You know, Rufus is, is probably a, a, a really good example of what the Connecticut Humane Society has been able to do thanks to contributions that come into us. Rufus, um, Pitbull mixed dog that that came in and was born with two front legs that were very misaligned. Um, it wasn't a, a condition of abuse, but it was just a con, you know congenital condition that made it very difficult for Rufus to walk um, and negotiate around. And he was picked up by one of our um, partnering animal control agencies here in Connecticut, and they were not able to find his original owners, so we suspect maybe he was dumped. And then uh, he was transferred from that animal control agency to the Connecticut Humane Society where we were able to step up and, and use the medical resources of our veterinarians on staff as well as orthopedic surgeons that we contract with um, across the state. And after, you know, nine long months of basically, you know, re under anesthesia, of course, but re-breaking both his front legs, um, casting those legs uh, with, you know, regular leg cast, and and then going through um, the process of learning to trust humans and learning to be a member of a family, we were able to, nine months later, find a forever loving home for Rufus. And, Hooray! And did you now, tell, tell me that all through the whole thing, that Rufus' tail was wagging? You know, I, I will tell you, there's definitely not a problem with Rufus' muscles in his tail. Um, dogs, <laughs> dogs have a really good way of telling us about emotions. And, and, you know, even dogs that have a little stubby tail, they just wag their whole rear end. But in the case of Rufus, <laughs> tail's constantly going like wipers on a windshield. And, and, uh, and he always wanted to share a kiss with his tongue, you know, during his time here. And so... You know, it, he, in the condition that he was in with many shelters across the United States, would never, ever been able to, you know, be given that, that second option. Um, and I think most adoptive prospective homes would have looked the other way because of his, his physical condition. And, and Thank you so much. Now tell us. We're able to do that here and, and, and find that forever home for him. Uh, James. Tell us about the Connecticut Humane Society. Well, I tell you, we're one of the older uh, uh, animal welfare organizations in the country. Uh, the, the very first recorded animal well-being or welfare society was the Royal SPCA in England. And that RSPCA was a model for the ASPCA in New York. And that original model... Uh, was carried on here in Connecticut based on the MSPCA in Boston back in the late 1800s. And so in 1881, the Connecticut Humane Society was actually started by a high school junior. Wow. Uh, here in Hartford. Wow. She and her family were high wealth individuals in, in the 1800s. And, and uh, uh, this, this high school junior they, with the help of her family, brought several hundred people together and helped form the Connecticut Humane Society, whose original charter was protecting those that, that could not speak for themselves. That included not only animals, but it also included women and children. In the 1800s, children were not protected. There was no oh. protective service. Um, the laws were not in place. Women oh. vote in the 1800s. Oh. So, um, our original charter was to protect women, children, and animals. 
uh, thanks to the influence of this, this teenager who, well into her 70s, continued to volunteer um, for the Connecticut Humane Society. And, and we originally had police powers. We had the ability to um, arrest individuals oh that abused women and children and, and animals. Wow. Take children and put them in safe, uh, uh, a safe haven as well as animals. And then we, you know, over the decades saw this ability that, you know, women had, had protection. Um, James, what was the name? Protection agencies. And then we just continued to, to foster the uh, advocacy for animals. James, what was the name of the lovely 17-year-old into her 70s? Uh, it was, and I, I'm sitting here, I, it, it'll come to me here in a second. It's okay. I, I will tell you that um, it's okay, you know, she passed away many decades ago, so I did get a chance to to meet her. But oh. uh, my understanding is what what a dynamo and, um, uh, you know, it is uh, pretty incredible, this, uh, this young lady. Her name was Gertrude O. Lewis. And she what was her went to high school name, at dear? Hartford High. What was and her at a time when mainly charitable groups were formed by men. Um, oh. And sometimes it was men, Mr. and Mrs. were part of it. But mm. the fact that this young lady stepped up and, and she was able to garner this protection for, you know, animals, wildlife, what, children. What, uh, what was her first uh, name, dear? How do you spell her first name? Gertrude. Oh, Gertrude. Okay. Gertrude O. Lewis. Gertrude O. Lewis. Yep. So, you, and Gertrude. and so for eighty four years, um, uh, she she was able to, um, you know, have that organization, uh, uh, Connecticut Humane Society, focused, and then in the sixties, uh, Connecticut formed the Department of Children and Families, or DCF, um, and so they stepped in and. And, and that's when we shifted into a primary focus of animals. You know, the reality is we work with animals, but our clients are people. Animals don't pick up the phone and <laughs> dial 911 for <laughs> assistance. They the people who call the Connecticut that's Humane right. Society. Okay. Animals, for the most part, don't have the ability to, you know, pick their family. Well, I had one. What, listen to this, James. I was talking to my neighbor. And we had a lovely conversation, and I hung up the phone, and I went back to my work, and within 30 seconds, I the phone rang, and I said, hello, and it was my neighbor, because my cat hit the rebound button, uh, hit the redial button. Oh, my gosh. So, in a way, animals can telephone. Well, and what's interesting is back in the day when people had a regular landline, I, I don't have one anymore, but... You used to be able to, you know, program a 911 button on your phone at home. <laughs> and I remember many, many years ago having police officers, you know, knocking on the door. They <laughs> discover that one of my cats got up on the kitchen counter, stepped on the 911 button, and called <laughs> the police. So it was, it was a good test of the system. Uh, the dispatcher laughed. The police officers laughed. The cat certainly got the biggest laugh out of the whole thing. So <laughs> Yes, right. Yeah, so I guess they can't doubt that. That's right, Jim. Yeah. Well, that was a good history. Now, you do so much for the public. Mm -hmm. What can the public do for you? Well, we are, while we have Connecticut in our name, we're not a state-funded entity. We're a private 501c3 free nonprofit, and so we depend on people who, who give up their time through volunteering, their talents. You know, we have veterinarians that, that provide medical services across the state, and treasures. We have people who contribute, and the majority of our funding comes from individuals. Um, again, no state or federal government money. Um, and, you know, fundraisers are hit or miss, corporate sponsorship the same way, but it's really contributions from people like you who respond to you know, a, a, a letter in the mail or um, uh, seek us out and say, you know, we want to put Connecticut Humane Society in our will. Um, we can't give now, but we can make a donation after our passing. And so 
for over 140 plus years since 1881. Uh, that's how we've been able to exist is through private donations from individuals. People will donate blankets, and I know you've done that for us as well. Um, so our animals have bedding, and and um, and certainly uh, contributions make it possible for us to say yes to the next dog like Rufus that comes under our care. Now we can look you up how your address and your telephone number. You know, so our our, our website, and more and more people have that ability to just you know go to the website. You can always Google Connecticut Humane Society. Uh, but our, our email address is cthumane.org, C is in cat, T is in Tom, humane.org. Um, you know, our phone number is, we have a 1-800 number because we're all over the state of Connecticut, 800-452-0114. Again, 800-452-0114. And we have three physical facilities across the, the state of Connecticut, one in Waterford, which is down in New London County, the south portion of the state. We have a location in Westport, which is down in uh, Fairfield County on the southwest portion of the state. And then we have a shelter in Newington, which is just south of uh, uh, downtown Hartford. And also out of that Newington facility, we have our Fox Memorial <laughs> Clinic, which is a veterinary clinic uh, that's open to the general public. We are, and I'm, I'm happy to share this with, with those that are, that are um, part of the show today, that we are going to be replacing our Westport facility with a new campus in Wilton, just oh, in Wilton. north of Westport. And we're going to be building a new facility to replace our Westport campus and added a veterinary hospital to oh. the, the underserved portion of the community. And, well, that's and nice. should be opening about a year from now uh, in Wilton. And that's in Fairfield County too, isn't it? That is correct. And it, it will also serve uh, Danbury, you know, you can pull from oh, really? of the state. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. Oh, very good to hear. So, do you, and, do and you... again, I think that Many people um, that surrender a pet or give up a pet are, are faced with a, a choice of either, you know, providing medical services for their themselves, their children, their animals, and medical care continues to skyrocket. It becomes very yeah. cost prohibitive for most, most individuals. But you know something, mm. James? I have noticed that the number of people who have dogs as companions has skyrocketed. It, most definitely, and I think the pandemic really escalated. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, how our animals are our emotional life preserver in times that are troubling for us. We tend to cling on to, you know, things that are the most important. Sometimes it's memories, sometimes it's friends and family. But our pets don't judge us. Our pets don't say, "I had a bad day in the office." <laughs> you know, cats may judge us in a certain way, <laughs> but dogs. Uh, and, and now that we have so many people that are working a hybrid model where they're working more at home. Or yes, right, home, right. It's easier to, to have that dog that you've been thinking in the past, you know, my lifestyle, my work. Uh, sure. And now, and now you have the ability to have your, your dog right there with you or your cat right there with you. And it's you. so much better for the dog or the cat. Most definitely. Now, honey... Tell me another one of your rescue stories, because people love to hear these. Well, I will tell you one of the stories that just, you know, really um, got to me. I, I, as a kid growing up, uh, and I, I actually was born in Arizona, and then I um, spent time in Texas, and now the last few years here in Connecticut, I, I grew up with um, a mom who lost her eyesight when I was just a young kid, and and so when we have dogs and cats that come into the shelter that have um, uh, been born a certain way, whether it's losing their, you know, eyesight or, or um, their hearing, we, we had a, a, a wonderful cat, a kitten named Steve, who was born with little micro type eyes. The eyes just never formed, and so they weren't functional. And so Steve came in without these eyes when, and we had another uh, kitten in here named Alice that had normal eyes. 
and, and they were housed together and became and are like buddies now. You know, suddenly Alice helped Steve move around. Steve got the benefit of Alice's guidance and, and you know, during that time period where they were both healing from malnutrition and other ailments, we eventually got them spayed and neutered and we were fortunate enough to be able to place both Steve and Alice together and Oh really a, a pet that oh, how to sweet. most shelters. Sweet Amy, isn't that sweet? Yeah. yeah. Amy loves that, yeah. Oh my gosh. So, you know, and we've seen stories like that where, you know, recently there was a story that about, uh, you know, a blind horse being paired up with another sighted horse and, and they basically become their, their service <laughs> creature. And, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and, and so we really pride ourselves at Connecticut Humane Society of taking on the cases that most shelters either just don't have the resources to do it. They don't have the medical expertise or behavior expertise. Um, yeah. I, yeah. You know, seeing Steve and, and Alice, you know, pair up just really melted everyone's hearts around. Oh, yes. Right. Oh, that's and so they sweet. Anchored themselves in a new human family. Tell us another one, would you, honey? Um, you know, we had, and, and again, another, uh, another dog that came in. We had lady who was a uh, about a two-year-old little pit bull mix that came into us completely deaf and so you know for and and not being properly cared for so when she came into us she, we had to learn how to communicate with her using what we call dog sign language and so <laughs> uh, and and learning how to uh, dogs already you know communicate with physical gestures as well as verbal gestures but we're not dogs so we don't we our ears don't perk up we don't have a tail that wags and, <laughs> and so they have to learn and we have to learn how to communicate with them and so after our, our remarkable behavior team worked with lady and they were able to get that communication together and help her learn how to walk on a leash and 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 react to those those uh, hand signals we then found a family that was willing to learn this modified dog really? sign language and and we were able to find lady a, a good forever home oh that's very, so, yeah that's very uh, good and she understood what a dog yummy was i guess i you know what food doesn't require language at all <laughs> so yeah, right. you know i think most of them they smell the food they're going to yeah. go for their scooby snack well jim what a good um, visit you have given us i'm so happy amy do you have any questions no. Now, Jim, spell your last name for us. It is Bias, B as in boy, I, A, S as in Sam. So it's like being biased uh, against people who abuse animals or if you're into sewing, it's cutting on the bias or ankle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So, and Jim, uh, uh, you are executive director? That's correct. Executive director for the Connecticut Humane Society, and I, I report to a seven-member board of directors that are all volunteers. Uh, they represent geographically; they're all over the state of Connecticut, and yeah. they bring their expertise and and give the guidance. And then I work yeah. with our, our staff and volunteers to fulfill our mission. Uh, now I know that you're on two other TV programs. Are you not? You know, we, we have some regularly scheduled segments with NBC Connecticut as well as um, uh, Fox 61 here in Connecticut. And then we have several other stations that will respond when needed with, with stories or, or certainly if there's a, a need for uh, uh, an update on something regarding animals. WTIC radio here in, in Connecticut, uh, 1080, they usually... This is good carve out some time this is uh, good. Saturday mornings to say what's going on with, with the animals in the Connecticut Humane Society. Well, now our advantage, dear, is that we are all over the state of Connecticut. All over. We're on something like 21 public access television stations in Connecticut. Uh, 15 coming out of Newtown, another 10 coming out of Torrington, another 14 coming out of North Windham. They're, we're all over the place, New Haven, uh, New London, 
Groton, and honey, we can uh, expand your uh, coverage. Well, and, and I know that Catherine Schubert, uh, she's our marketing communications manager. I know she and other members of our team provide um, uh, information dissemination with our different media partners, whether it's online, television, radio, yeah. print, and, and I, without them, I, I I have to fulfill my job as executive director, so usually um, regular scheduled segments like that are, are getting harder and harder for me to carve out time for. Yes, okay, it's honey. my favorite time, particularly when I take a pet onto a, a into a newsroom or into a, a radio station, because I feel like I'm bringing, I feel like I'm Santa Claus bringing gifts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I show up with a little live yeah. creature, but uh, yeah. I know Catherine Schubert. Um, and, and her well, team are always looking for opportunities. I understand, but I thank you considering. Now, honey, would you uh, be able, you folks, to send us uh, emails, pictures of your little kitties, doggies, and rabbits, and and things like uh, that to encourage people to give them homes? Well, what, what we can do, and I'm trying to think how we push out right now. I know we have unique cases that we will send out, and certainly Catherine can get you on our, our, our media list. But I, uh, I, all of our animals that we currently have available are updated at, in real time on our website, cthumane.org, that lists all of the creatures that are currently available today um, at all three of our locations. In some instances, the animals may still be in a foster home, but if you happen to see a dog like Rufus, and Rufus, uh, you know, strikes a, a, a chord with your heart, you would reach out to us, and we would schedule a time. And sometimes it's bringing them from that foster home up to one of our shelters, and then you can do a meet and greet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the power of, of whether it's the internet, getting information out there live, is is certainly helpful. And then our foster families allow us to go beyond the walls of our shelter. Okay. Not and not every animal does well in a shelter, um, you know. And so I know, for example, my wife and I have fostered some cats that I would call them misunderstood. They don't do well in the shelter, but they do well in home. <laughs> and so when we have somebody who we're able to make a love connection on online, then I can bring the the, the cat up here. They can do a meet and greet. If it doesn't work. And the cat goes back home with me until we can find that perfect uh, <laughs> match. I, and, and so, I didn't get the because, chance to tell you my story, honey. What, uh, tell me your story. Well, a dog, a cat, and a bird all died on the same day, and they all went to heaven. And God said to the dog, where do you want to sit? And the dog says, on your right. And God said to the uh, other one, uh, where do you want to sit? And that one said, I want to sit on your left. And God said to the cat, where do you want to sit? And the cat says, I think you are sitting in my chair. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? We all <laughs> tend to be slaves to our cats, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Jim, thank you for spending time with us. Well, thank you for having me. And again, we appreciate yeah. everything you do for the state of Connecticut. And, you betcha. And and, and you betcha, and we'll do all we can. I wish we could do more. Now, stay on the line. We're going to cut out on the TV program. Uh, Amy, is there anything else to say? Uh, no, but you got five minutes left. We have five minutes left? Yep. Wonderful. Jim, another rescue. Well, what I might do is, and this, this may be helpful for uh, those that are, that are uh, part of the show, we, we've had a very mild um, uh, winter, and winter has a tendency to really impact fleas and ticks. And because of that mild winter, we're already seeing an explosion of animals that, that have skin issues. And uh -huh. so people need to get ahead of this and get, get with their veterinarian, their dog groomer, their cat groomer, and get their pet on some type of prevention uh, so that they're, they're not dealing with significant bites, you know, Lyme disease is an issue for Amy, that one clear is dogs right. picking up uh, ticks. And so, um, you know, right now our, our medical team are having to deal with, you know, significant skin issues.
tissues, and it's usually, again, an allergic reaction to the saliva of the biting uh, parasites. Of course, they can also carry disease. So if... Um, Amy, that would not apply to uh, Iris and your doggy and your kitty because they're in the house all the time, right? Yeah. Yep. But when you take them for a walk, is there a possible chance they could get a tick? You, you can certainly, you know, ticks jump on people. Uh, they do, and they can come home, and, and uh, fleas can do the same thing. While they're host-specific, they prefer the blood of a dog, and in some instances, cats. Um, but, you know, you can certainly do yourself a favor to, to get ahead of it. There's nothing worse than to have a, a significant outbreak of parasites like that. And oh, terrible. I old winter... As nice as it was, you know, on our heating bill, um, it also made it very nice for parasites that normally would have their breeding cycle. Well, good morning, James Bias. You certainly used your time well, and we are grateful for all that you do for these lovely sweethearts. Thank you, and, and again, we appreciate everything you do as well to get the message out. You betcha. Say goodbye to Amy. Goodbye, Amy. Bye. Goodbye, Amy. Bye. <laughs> Uh, Jim, stay on the line, will you? Okay, will do. All right. Now, you're going to be on the YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter within the hour, dear. Sounds good. Yep. And do you have email access and everything? Oh, yes, I do. Um, if you if you have any links or anything, if you can just, I, I can give you my email address. Please do. Uh, Amy. Real easy. <laughs> so it's just J bias, just the letter J B I A S, all one word. Okay. At cthumane.org. At c c c h c t like Connecticut. Oh, c Connecticut. Okay. Uh, humane h u m a n e dot org. Dot org. Yeah. I got it. Now, honey, just as soon as you sign that paper in two places and give proof that you are who you are, yep. uh, I will send you that $350 by personal check. Okay, and I've got that that, that uh, landed in my inbox this morning, so I will fill out my info here. I'll attach a business card as well. Yeah, that's all you um, have to do. And I see a, a signature on the first page. And it looks like on the third page. That's it. Okay. Now, are you going to send that to me by email, or do you want to send it to me by U.S. mail? You know, if you want to, what I'll do, I'll get your email address when you send me whatever it is that you have there, and then I can I'm going to give turn it to around you. and just scan this in a PDF and send what? it back to you. Excellent. Sure. I'm going to give it to you right now. A chat with Glendora at Gmail. It's called Kitty Quarters. Okay. Well, I know there's so many wonderful people here in Connecticut that uh, I started here in February of 2020, and the pandemic locked everything down that next month. And so it's it's been, you know, a challenge.